What's the show, Jeff? What's the name of the show? The name of the show is uh, The History of Curb Your Enthusiasm with uh, Susie Essman and Jeff Garland. And she is Susie Essman. I am Jeff Garland. This is the show. This is the show. This is our first episode. Yes. And we're going to talk about... Pre the show, pre the show was the so-called pilot, which was actually just a special when it was first made. What was it called? It was called Larry David Curb Your Enthusiasm. Larry David Curb Your Enthusiasm. And I was not in it, so I'm going to ask you a lot about it. Oh, please ask me questions. If you want to start from pre-Curb where it started, and then all the way through, I've got you know, different so this was, a- anecdotes before we even go into the thing. Was this 1999, I believe? It, it might have been starting in 98. I can't remember, but mm-hmm. we shot it for sure in 99. Do you know what year Larry left Seinfeld? I, I have no idea. Yeah. But he, he, had, he had been out of Seinfeld for a few years already. Yeah, he, 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 the last two years, he was not the showrunner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I... Th- well, prior to doing this... Yeah. He had done two things which were not that successful. One was the finale of Seinfeld, where Correct. he took a lot of shit. Yeah. A lot of shit. And, and the it other was, was unfair. Sour grapes. And sour grapes. Yeah. Which I can tell you, I auditioned for sour grapes, believe it or not. He knows this. I auditioned for sour grapes, the part of a limo driver who gets into a fight with one of the guys, what have you. That script from page one on had me laughing. What if I said page six on? That's yeah, interesting. It, yeah. uh, but page one on, I was laughing hysterically. Yeah. So hard because I imagined it and I Larry's writing appeals to me. So when I saw it, it was disappointing to me because it wasn't the script. The script was the movie in my head. And then I saw it. And so some things work. I thought it was well cast. Mm-hmm. Well, I thought everything about it, it was good. It doesn't always it just, work. It things does, don't By the way, work. it's so hard to make a movie. It didn't work. Right. But so he's coming off things. that That's why I said not too successful. Right. Although Except I imagine for the, Seinfeld. But there are a lot of viewers, <laughs> but he took a lot of shit. Yeah. Okay. So if you're jumping to somewhere, and I know there's something before that that I want to talk about, I'll let you know. So, so I just want to get, you know, just just for the record, how this all came about. I, I know you and Larry were in, sharing an office suite. Is that correct? It was Larry David, uh, Alan Zweibel, mm-hmm. and Billy Crystal. And this was over at um, on Maple at uh, Castle Rock. At Castle Rock. And... I was just excited to be near Larry David and to be near Billy Crystal. And I w- wanted to say I was thrilled to, to write with, with um, uh, Alan Zweibel. So where was your career at this point? I mean, you were doing stand-up okay. for many years. And at you and I first, point, let me just say, you and I first met doing stand-up. And that's when I first met Larry as well in, at Catch a Rising Star. Catch a Rising New York Star, Clubs. yes. Um, in the 80s. And we hit it off right away, right we away. We were friends, like, boom. Yeah. And, uh, you and know, I had a nickname for you. I called you Smokey. You did call me Smokey. <laughs> Do you remember the reason why? I don't. Oh, that's so funny. You know what? There wasn't a reason. I just looked at you. And, and you t- went Smokey? You were Smokey. Can you think of a person who's less Smokey than me? Smoky. No, if I, I had a cigar all the time, I smoky. wasn't thinking smoky. If in I terms lived in of, the Smoky Mountains, smoky. But I wasn't thinking in terms of smoky like cigarettes or, or anything. Or the mountains, or what were you or, or Smoky Robinson. I wasn't uh, right, thinking of. Right. I was just. Although I do great versions of Smoky Robinson and the Miracles. I'd never heard that. Naked in the mirror in the morning. <laughs> all right, keep going. I don't know. I just looked. It was, you know, the Smoky the Bear. You were cuddly. Oh, you were, if you're going down the Smoky the was, Bear. I think that's what it was. Well, there you go. Yes, I'm with you. You but were cuddly I, the way, and lovable. That's what you were. And so I named you Smoky. <laughs> okay, yeah, good. All right, so go ahead. All right, so, so that... So, also, I want to add, at that point, I had been doing parts on TV shows, small parts in different sitcoms, and I had a lot of development deals that had gone nowhere. Okay. Where I was under contract for a year to develop something, and it went nowhere. Which, by the way, I'm just going to say for the audience, is extremely frequent with development oh, deals. Oh, very much yeah. so. But I've been lucky that I got one after another. Mm-hmm. I was development deal Johnson. I mean, And that, you, were, you were mad about you. And- well, that's what I was about that. I was a... I was a recurring on Mad About You, but I was on that show a lot. Mm-hmm. And I was teamed up with Alan Zweibel to 
do a companion? Oh, you. I, I just want to s- tell people who Alan's White oh, Bell is. Do. For yeah. those who don't know, Alan's White Bell was one of the original SNL writers. Yes, and he's a comedy writer and right. like that. That's all you're going to say for Alan Zweibel. Do you want me to give his resume? (laughs) Yes, but Alan Zweibel co-created at Scary Shandling Show. Yes, he did, yes. um, He's he's a very well-known, well- Yeah, no, and he's He's got a great resume. And by the way, done some, he wrote on Curb, he was like an extra writer. A consultant, yeah. A consultant, and also he was really funny on Curb. He's just one of the funniest people I know. he's one of my very close friends as well. Yes, and by the way- couldn't love a guy more, right. except for Lee Kernis, <laughs> sitting right to the right of me. All right, yeah, he doesn't even enjoy that. So, so well, you're doing a development deal with you know, Alan Swipe Bell. Yes, for CBS. They want us to create a show that is um, a companion show to Everybody Loves Raymond. Uh-huh. And Alan and I were, were teamed up. You know, we're writing, whatever. And Larry would come by, and we would talk. To, to both of us. And I would also go into Larry's office who had young children the same as mine. And our bonding came. Now, I already knew Larry from stand-up, and I loved him. But our bonding came on Shirley Temple. Both our kids uh, at that time watched all the time. They watched the um, the best of Shirley Temple, all these songs, you know, uh, the Codfish Bowl, all that stuff. Good ship, lollipop. Yes. Larry and I knew the words to all of them, <laughs> having sung them. So I would go in his office and start singing one, and he joined me. So it was really fun. So Shirley Temple brought yeah. you together. I, see, I never knew no, this. No, but there's also an irony that I'll bring up in a second. Um, so... Also, when Larry would come to our office, we'd tell him how we were doing. And my favorite thing, one of the main people, actors, we wanted for our show was Adam West in mm-hmm. a key role as my boss. Adam West, a- who played Batman. Batman, who I do an impression of. Hello, Susie, how are you? So help me if the Joker, Riddler, and the Penguin come near you, I will have to get Chief O'Hara. All right, anyhow. Very good. Thank you. So, um, Larry comes in, and the first thing, first joke he said is we're working on this. We told him our idea for Adam West, and Larry goes, yeah, I think you can get him. (laughs) (laughs) That was my worst Larry impression I've ever done. I do a good one. I do this one stylized impression. Anyhow, one day, this is, I'm getting to the core now. Yeah. Okay. One day, Larry came in and asked Alan and I to go to lunch. Alan did not want, he couldn't go. It's not, he didn't want to, you know, he couldn't go. So Larry and I went to lunch at the Kukuru across the street from Nate and Al's. I remember distinctly the Kukuru. He and I are sitting in the back and he's asking me a lot of questions about stand up. Now, for, I have a question for uh, you. Yeah, yes. Because my timeline is off. When I met Larry in 1985 doing yeah, stand-up, yeah. you weren't around yet then no, in New York. No, I came up a bit after that. So yes. had were you around in the days when he was hanging out Almost at the clubs? Almost definitely. I, okay. I, I am a person who witnessed him going. Uh, the one I saw him do was look at the audience, look around. At the very beginning, go, eh, not tonight. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I I witnessed one where he looked at the audience and said, I don't think so. And I just walked up. But, <laughs> but I wasn't sure if Larry you were around do that. before yes. that. Yeah. Yes. Well, by the way, there's a boundary. That, like it's, I believe it's 86 when I moved to New York. I'm pretty sure. Okay. Okay. So shortly thereafter yes, that. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and when we met Larry, he was a stand-up comic. That's yes, what he, he was. was. He was a stand-up comic. No. Hold on. Well, he, he had, had done Fridays. He had done Fridays, right. which I used to love. But primarily, yeah. I loved him and Michael Richards. And Larry used to do this, these pro wrestlers uh, who, who do this. And it was just, a, he, he was hilarious on that yeah. show. Everything he did and his look. So I, he was someone I looked up to. When I met him, I'm like, wow, Larry David. Yeah. You know, and and you, know, point, you know what else I remember it, it, from those days? I remember uh, once I did a, a new bit or something and he was in the room watching me and somebody told me, it was Scott Carter actually told me afterwards, Larry thought that new bit you did was really funny. And I remember feeling like you always wanted Larry to think you were funny. It, it, there was by, a respect level there. But by the way, the idea that I have Larry David's number 
that I say things that he thinks are hilarious yeah. all the time, that he laughs hard from the stupid bullshit that I say, the non sequiturs, the nonsense. I never that, heard you do that. Oh, you're a loser. <laughs> but the point is that to have his number, every single time he laughs hard at me, I'm like, this is the coolest. Yeah, there, there's this just the something coolest. about yes. it. So I just want to add, that's where my career was, but something I had done previous to this moment, this is the key thing. I had helped develop John Stewart's Unleavened and Dennis Leary's Lock and Load. So those uh, are were stand-up specials. specials. For Dennis Leary and John Stewart, two guys I was friends with. Right. And I used to think that I was the co-director. But as I thought about it, you don't direct stand-up, you know, and the other person directs the cameras. So what I really was, even though I got a credit on one as director and one as... Point being is I was a de I developed it. Mm -hmm. I was a consultant, but I, I really hands-on developed. I went on tour with John Stewart and Dennis Leary, would open for them and then go sit in the back Watch room. Watch and with, take with notes. A, and, this, open. Yeah. and then we, every night we would go over the notes. Right, and how to structure it. So, and yeah, and, and yeah. so I experienced the developing of a stand-up special right. in that way you mm -hmm. know that's an important point it is an important point and for my performance special i had an hbo half hour in a group of people with like Dave one night Chappelle. stands one, yeah, I, did, I had one so, too, yeah, yeah you had the first round yeah. and i was in the second round yeah and um yeah so that was my, my experience okay right. so he's asking me questions about the current state of stand-up at that point because he wanted to go back on well, stage he was thinking about it he was he, you know he wanted to get the info you know, right. um, and you know, with Larry, there's a, I, I am enamored of his ability to ponder. He ponders long beyond the point of uncomfortability for mm -hmm. me. Like I'll ponder for a while and then I'll feel pressure within myself to come up with an answer. He'll ponder forever. So I, I didn't know it then, but I know now this is part of his pondering process. Mm -hmm. Pondering process. Yes, it's a pondering process. By the ocean with a seashell. Yeah. I just want to say a little bit about Larry's stand-up. When we yeah. used to see him in right. the 80s before he did Seinfeld. And his stand-up, and some of it is in the special, yes. which some of my favorite bits Some of my the favorite special. bits. And by the way, yesterday I was talking with Larry about those bits. So yeah. when they come up, I'll talk about okay, them. Okay, great. Yeah. Because, but we all would go in the room to watch him yeah. because his stand-up was so funny he i would, mean the, the, way, the writing was the brilliant by the way my dream as a comic i swear early on i never thought about specials or anything i just wanted comedians to come in when i was on yeah. stage that was like a big goal well, of it, life. it's it, it's a great compliment we yeah. would all go to watch like and part of it was that it was so funny and the other part was you never knew what was going to happen well, yeah, there, he was they, so volatile he, by the way either one of them would have been great to right. watch him do his stuff or watch him go, not tonight, and walk off. Correct. You or, couldn't lose. Or something in between where he'd see, he, he'd be killing and oh, somebody no. would look at their he watch and he, he would storm off in the he, middle. He, yes, but that but that includes it falling apart yeah. in some yeah. way. So, so he was fascinating to watch. Fascinating to watch. So he was so he wanted to get back on stage. He was do thinking stand about it. And he had never really been what you would call a successful stand-up comic. And no. I think that that was something that he wanted. And his comedy was pretty much unique to New York. I don't even know how much stand-up he... I know he played the store, comedy store some, but he wasn't like a road comic, to no, my knowledge. never, never. Uh, although I met him when he was going to the last year of Comiskey Park in Chicago, and he came in, I was actually performing with Meany, and he came, Kevin, Kevin Meany. Kevin Meany, our who, dear friend who's no longer with us. Who was the funniest, funniest in the whole world. Made me cry. Um, Larry showed up, I remember, with a Blackhawks jacket. He had this leather, black leather arms, Blackhawks jacket, which I thought was so cool. We started talking, and then he was going to like one of the last games at Comiskey Park. He was very excited. That's where we first met, okay? So... He's asking me all these questions. I'm telling him what's going down. He's listening. And, uh, and then it hit me. Boom. Like it really hit me because of my John Stewart and Dennis Leary. I go, if you ever want to do an HBO special, I've got an idea for a special. We could uh, shoot you developing a special. And then at the end... Even in real time, based on your decision, we could show a real special or show you getting out of the special. Mm -hmm. There's my contribution, everybody. And that we improvise. Those are the 
two things because that was my idea when we were going to do it. I said to him, "You're not going to have to learn lines. We'll improvise the whole right. thing." Right? He doesn't like we'll do learning scenes. lines. Well, who does? By the, Some and, people. by the way, that's the hardest thing that an actor does. Director, it's prep. Actors, it's uh, learning, learning lines. lines. And comedians, it's listening to your set that night or the next day. Yeah, I never then, did that. Because it's, it, it's painful. It's painful. It's like going to the dentist. Yeah. You think that we're like ego people. Like, oh, I'm going to listen to how great I was. No. And by the way, you're never as good as you thought you were <laughs> when you listen to those tapes. You see all the flaws. Oh, my God. It's, how it's, did it's I, cringe. And even when you kill, you're like, how did I kill? What was wrong with those people? So I said that to him. And his eyes lit up. Oh, oh, that's not bad. That's not bad. And he said, let me go home and think about it. And he went home and he thought about it. And I told, I went home and told Marla, my wife of yore, who we both love. Yes. I, lo I love her for obvious reasons. It's weird that I, my ex-wife is my family. Like that's no, I don't think that's weird at all. Well, you no, have no, children saying, together. And yeah, but I love her so much, Marla. You, and, know, you, uh, could, you could love people and you could share so many things with them. It doesn't mean that you need to be living with them and married to them. By the way, who did I learn that from? Me. Yes. <laughs> and what did I tell Marla over and over to have her come to terms with us splitting up? I said, if you think I love you any iota less than I did, you're wrong. I just feel we can't be married. And you saved me with that. That was well, the there key. You go. By the way, we should also explain this. Uh, two things. Number one, at this point, we, have, we are two days in on shooting season, season 11. 12. 12. No, 12. Yeah. Mom. <laughs> by the way, that's me. That's you. <laughs> I get things wrong. She gets, by the way, if we talk about something and we argue, know that she's right. I just want to like not necessarily. Well, but by the way, I'm going to say this. Okay, necessarily, maybe. Okay, and the other one was oh, you know, you see us in a confrontational. Actually, she's confrontational. Her character on the show, and I want to avoid confrontation. So if you see me confrontational on the show, that's rare. But in as they say, real life. We couldn't be better friends. No. I look at you as like a rock in my life. You're just fucking solid for me. And we love each other dearly. So that is kind of funny. And and it's and it's long, you know, yeah. we've had our ups and downs. Oh, we've yes, had our we things. Yes, I mean, yes. it's like a full but that, relationship. But that's, but that's true friends. You got to disagree. You got to be mad at you're like, fuck them. Yeah. No, you have to. Yeah. No, it's a real, real friendship. And so and by the way, let me also add this. Everyone that's on Curb Your Enthusiasm, the main people that you guys see every week, we all love each other. Yes, very dearly. much. And anytime we'd love to spend time with each other off screen, which you don't often see. I've never had a show where there was a connection between the performers like this show. And th there's two aspects to that. One is you when you're improvising, you have to trust people. Yes. Very, very much so. No, by the way, it's very much so. You have and, to. And we've been doing it for 22 years at this point yeah. and knew each other from, be I mean, there's a long, long history here yes, with yes, all of us. Yes. No, it it's amazing. It's just amazing. You know, I was looking at, at JB yesterday and I was just thinking, man, I love that guy. Yeah. It's interesting to be doing the history of Curb Your Enthusiasm while we're filming a season. That's true. Yeah. That's so, true. So hopefully we um, get the stuff that they'll still be. So season 12, we're in the middle. We're, we just started yeah, shooting season yeah, 12. Yeah. We're, we're, and, and yeah, that's right. Okay. Very so exciting. Was, where did I go okay. off at a tangent? So, so Larry then thought about I it. I thought about it. And I told Marla about it. But I told it from the standpoint that I was going to get to write it with Larry and direct it. Mm -hmm. And the next day he called and he said, I want to do it. And I'm like, are you kidding me? This was a huge break for me because I went to bed thinking this is never going to happen. But, but it was about his stand up. It wasn't at this point about the fictitious world. The stand up would be real as he's developing it, right. developing. And if he did a special at the end, that would be real. But the stuff with all the characters would be fictitious from the get go. That would not be real. Yeah, I, but was that was that aspect discussed? Is is my oh yeah, numerous yeah. times. It it's ironic when you consider who directed it, which we'll get into. But I wanted mine to be less of the family stuff, less of the off stage. I mean, and more of the on stage. You know, mm -hmm. but it expanded as we were developing it. Right, uh, and it's ironic because Bob Whitey, who directed 
this. He's a documentarian. He's a documentarian. And I wanted it more that way. But it was and shot. It was an in-between. Yeah. It was like it was a, a mock, hybrid. It was a mock doc. Right. With real stand-up segments. Right. Like there was never, this time and just And real bottom. interviews with real people. I yes, mean, it's confusing. Except for, hold on. Mine and Cheryl's, which I don't know if Cheryl was interviewed, but my interviews were, of course, fictional. I wasn't Yours was, manager. Cheryl was not interviewed, as, as, as I recall. Yeah. But you and Cheryl were playing characters when they interviewed Jerry and, and uh, no, Jason. No, those were all real. Those were real, exactly. Rick Newman. So Rick Newman, that yeah. Was, yeah. So Rick Newman, who was uh, on Catch a Rising Star. Yeah. Um, and by the way, the nicest comedy club. He loved comedians. He did. And, and he loved to work for a man or be around a guy who loves comedians. The only other person I know who loves comedians. George is, Shapiro. Well, no, but George Shapiro was does what Lee Kearns Yeah, he was does. a manager. Yeah, oh, you uh, mean a club owner. No, and by the way, George Shapiro, please look him up. Please Google George Shapiro. He was one of the great loves of my life. He was a mentor. He was a friend. And he might have been, you know what? He might have been the nicest man who ever lived. I swear to God. Yeah, and he, he was involved with Seinfeld. Yeah, he because was Seinfeld's manager. He was Seinfeld's manager. And he was also, wasn't he an EP on Seinfeld? Yes, yes, he yeah. was. And also he was Andy Kaufman's manager, yeah. which I was more. Jerry Seinfeld is not a, gener, a generation before me as a right. comedian. Right. Paul Reiser, there's a whole group of them. And I look up to them and respect them. But Andy Kaufman, him being Andy Kaufman's manager, was like... That was oh, more your style. That, well, that was, I was just... And I, that was also a big influence. I wasn't influenced yeah. by Jerry Seinfeld. I was influenced by Andy Kaufman right. as a human being, too. <laughs> <laughs> Off stage and on. So, so th this hybrid thing yes. of some of it is real. Larry David is, is, is playing yes. Larry yes. David, but he's actually not... La you know, yes. You're playing Jeff Green. Yes, um, but I want to add something here. This is really... This is interesting i hope larry and i after he said yes either the next day within the next day or two we went to lunch at what it used to be called the newsroom on robertson i remember all the restaurants because i remember when we filmed the show i can remember most of the restaurants mm -hmm. where we filmed especially the early years and um we're talking about the show and this is where i got like a bit of a shocker he said to me I don't want you to direct it. And I, of course, when he said that, my heart sank. Yeah. He goes, no, you're going to be an executive producer. And I didn't know that executive producers in television are creative voices. Uh -huh. I just thought some that, are, some are not. There's this. Oh no, but yeah, but the, the, there's like like our managers right. might be executive producers, and they're not going to be writing the show right. week in and out, week out. But they're still very helpful. So I thought, oh, he's going to take my idea, and I'm going to be kicked to the curb. Then he says to me, "Oh, I, I want you to play my manager in it. You're perfect to play my manager." And I was like, "Really?" And he goes, "Yeah." Now at this point, I didn't know it was going to be a TV series, so right. I thought, "Oh, this will be fun. Cool. I'll be your manager." Right. And I can started thinking about it, not too hard, but just like thing. And then he, he, he told me he wanted Bob Whitey to direct it based. He's known Bob for years because we knew it was going to be a mockumentary. Right. Based Bob on Whitey Bob, was a documenter, yeah. documentary. So based on Bob's experience, he came in. Right. And so. Did you, you didn't know him? No, that's how yeah. I met him. Mm -hmm. And um, basically it was the three of us that were the creative voices Um through the whole thing. How long know? did it take to shoot? We went to New York. Yeah. We shot some in LA, but I think it took a couple weeks. Uh huh. That's it? Know? Well, with all the stand up, you have to add more. Yeah. So, what, like, there'd be a particular week where we just shoot Larry doing stand up maybe twice in that week, you know? So. And, and so. And also, by the way, I want to add one more bonus thing. This is just to put it out there. Laura, who used to be Fairchild. Fairchild Stryker. Now Stryker. Yeah. I met her when she was 23 because she was Larry's assistant. She's a co-executive producer on the show who does great work. She, amazing did, work. Amazing work. And she's, she's essential for the show. And she is the only other person who was there at the beginning. Yeah. And then Bob and stopped working on the show. Uh, yeah, and Cheryl, too. But on an everyday level, it's uh, Laura, myself, and Larry. Yeah. Who can say, because Cheryl comes sometimes, Bob Whitey comes sometimes. Yeah. But we've been through the whole festival. Yeah. yeah.
which is quite unusual. I mean, we have, you know, some crew people who've been there for all 12 seasons. It's, you know. Well, yes, but it's a very short list, and it, it's led off with uh, Thomas. With Thomas, Alaric. our makeup. Yeah, who will be on the show because he's fascinating. And by the way, he's an inspiration to me in terms of style and how you carry yourself. Yeah. I have learned so much from Thomas. Yeah, he's, a, he's an amazing human being. Amazing human yeah. being. But yeah. he didn't do the hour. He did not do the hour. No, he didn't. That he was a whole. That's he why he came on the first season one. This, this is separate. So at what okay. point, we have so much to talk about because yeah. we haven't even gotten to the episode. So you start doing this. It was an HBO special to yes, air on HBO, it was HBO. and, and you, they, when, they yeah, wanted to do stuff with Larry. And you pitched it to who? Carolyn Strauss. Who, who? Who was the exec on this? Chris Albrecht. Chris Albrecht. Okay. And we went into Chris Albrecht, and I swear, Chris Albrecht said this. This what you because you go in, you pitch something. Mm-hmm. Every blue moon, someone says yes in the room. Most of the time, they say nothing. As Dorothy Parker said, you know, only in Los Angeles can you die from encouragement. (laughs) So they say nothing with a lot of positivity. And then there are those great executives who I respect who say no in the room. So you're not wasting a minute of your thought process. And you respect that. Chris Albrecht said these words that I never have experienced and never will again. How can we not do this? There you go. Who has ever said that? Well, what but he executive was right. has said that? Yes. And Chris Albrecht, by the way, you know, greenlit Sopranos, but also, Curb. I mean, a but lot a, of great but a shows. a long history at the Improv in New York. Right, and understood stand-up. Com- understood stand-up, knew all the comedians. Yeah. Yeah. So you pitch it, you get your budget, you, yeah. and, and you just start. And by the way, our offices are, you know, there's those towers in where HBO used to be in Century City. Mm-hmm. And if you go to the HBO office, you go up to them, there's another episode that goes up to these little suite of offices that nobody's in, and there's no windows, and there's screening room. That was on our floor. So we're in these little suite, little rooms, little boxes that we, we were in, and we're developing it and developing it. By the way, Larry finished writing it, the outline, before we even got there. Was the outline written in the way that we know the curb outlines to be, or was it different? It was a little and, rougher, and, but and it was the same. Let, let's just take this opportunity for our audience, that if they're curb fans, they already know this. But, but by the way, if they're not curb fans, why are you listening to this? Exactly. There are so many other... But let me just say, yeah. we do not have a script. We have an outline, a yes. very detailed outline. Each scene is about a paragraph. There's no dialogue written, but it's a, it's a very tight outline well it used to be meaning our outlines were seven pages now they're 25 now, pages yes but there's still it's still the same concept which oh by is, the way the, the way i keep it real for myself i read the outline once and then i put it in a drawer so when i go to set i just say to jeff schaefer who directs most of director, the episodes, yeah, episodes and, and he's the executive another executive producer and he creates the outlines with larry Yes, he, this, this well, he has before, but really this season, I don't think I did he get credit last season. Yes. So it was a two, yeah, but before, yeah. you know, anyhow, I just walk up to Jeff before a scene. Say, I go, what's the scene? What, what's the scene? What am I doing? Yeah. Well, so we there's no lines to learn, and that keeps me really fresh right. in the moment. So if I had to look at the outline and then go do the scene... I would but stink. we don't plan anything ahead of time. No, it's all improvised. We, it's all improv. But we've both worked with people that yeah. you know they're pre-planning lines. Well, I don't want to mention any names. I will. It's Richard Lewis. <laughs> Richard Lewis, when he comes into work, has index cards. Like if we're in a restaurant, and you know the middle where the sugar and the salt are, those things. Yeah. He'll like set it in there. And Larry and I will sit on the opposite side, and I'll nod to Larry like, yeah, he's got it again. Yeah. And then Larry will talk about it. We'll, we don't really rehearse. We just know where the cameras are going to be. And when we block for camera, we don't speak. No, we wait just, until action to actually start improvising. Yeah, so we just walk around to see where the camera's. So, so as soon as we start rolling, Larry rips <laughs> the index card. Yeah. I've seen him do this too many times away from Richard, who has a look of shock on his face and then does a great job because you don't want to prepare you with ideas. You don't want to prepare. Yeah. And so for the pilot, it was the same type of yeah. outline. Yes. Now we're more specific in our discussions after every take, mm-hmm. uh, which are pretty much usually Jeff, myself, and Larry, we're very specific. And Jeff Schaefer, who holds our show together. Totally. Totally holds our show together. He 
will let Larry know what specifically needs to be covered. So he's on top of it. He's got he's the got outline. The whole, yeah. He's got the whole season yeah. in his head. Yes, and we Larry, shoot so much out of Larry order. Larry will look at the outlines yeah. over and over. And I'll just go on. Yeah. What do I do? I look at the outlines. And before I do a scene, I look at it. just so. And I also like to know what came before and, and what's coming after in terms of tone. Right. You know, if somebody's screaming and yelling at him in the scene before, the way, I don't want to do that. In I, my, you but, know. but here's this thing. The hour, the, the, the pilot was shot in order. Was shot, oh, it was. What, 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 what's that sequence. called? Sequence. In sequence. Yeah. It was all shot in sequence, which made the uh, line producer... His, he had fireworks coming out of his head every day yeah. from anger and confusion. And um, we yeah, don't so, do that any longer. No. So you knew what was coming next because we're, you just we're shot we, it. we shot it. So the only thing that mattered was what we just shot because the other things in the future. So what did we just shoot? Okay, now we're here. Well, it's obviously it's easier to shoot in sequence, but financially, it's really, yeah. you can't do that. Well, we used to shoot a lot more in sequence than we do more now. More in sequence. It was, by the way, I think we even went into season one and season two sequence. Sequence, more yeah. or less. Yeah. yeah and then it, it gets, a, less it, it gets difficult now, I think, right. because we have so many guest stars and then right. it's a schedule. And it, you know. Right. No, of course, now it's totally different. So, all right. So what kind of budget did you have? Did you know? Really low. Really low. I'm guessing... To shoot the whole thing, if I remember correctly, maybe half a million, mm -hmm. 400,000. Which is low for an hour. Well, you're low for not only an hour, but it's going on HBO. Yeah. So that was our budget. We also had, this is the one time, you know how like you know you're right and you're positive that everybody else is wrong and then you're proven to be right, which is rare because you go, oh, no, no, they were right. Or there's a in between. This is completely black and white on myself and the show. So we're, we're in a development meeting with not only HBO, but all the tech people, the, the creatives, all that. And they got to the cameras part and they started talking about what the cameras were going to use are. And it was a digi beta, which at that time was a cutting edge. And if you look at it now, it looks fine. Yeah. But with 4K, it's horrible. And the other camera was going to be a high eight, which for people off the street who would go into a Best Buy, that would be the best camera they could buy. But it's nothing compared to DigiBeta. And I said, what are we shooting on now? And so I said, you're going to cross shoot with a digi beta and a high eight. Were they going to do the high eight for what? Like the stand up? No, they were doing the high eight as the other camera. So oh, they I shot see. the whole. I see. So that doesn't watch, make any sense. So I recently this past week watched it again and it is, I, it was glaring to me back then, but now it's like the high eight stuff is ordering on unwatchable because mm -hmm. it's shiny on people's heads. They're washed out. It's horrible. Yeah. And then they cut to the use of the other camera. Everything looks great. Mm -hmm. You're not questioning Whose decision was that? Oh, that was, well, I'll tell you, it was everyone else because everyone else told me it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Yeah. I mean, Larry and, doesn't know anything about cameras. Including the cameraman, I think, the, the DP. Mm -hmm. I'm not positive, but you just said the key thing. I went to Larry and I begged him. After we're out of the meeting, I go, you got to make them use the same camera. It's got to be DigiBeta. But our budget, we yeah, couldn't get a second yeah. DigiBeta. So, but he also had no idea no what idea. I was talking about. Yeah. And he had come from uh, multi-camera. I mean, yes. Seinfeld was multi-camera. It was a completely yes. different animal than single camera. And that's also what Fridays was. Right. And those were film cameras back then, by mm -hmm. the way. They weren't even digital. Digital was... So far from, we're shooting this on digital, we're really er early on the whole digital thing. Mm -hmm. And people back then laughed at digital, like, you know, and we said we're shooting it in digital, like, I'm sorry, you know, that type of stuff. But it would have been looked good and consistent if we used the both. And it's a nightmare. My favorite thing, this is the last anecdote about this, uh, it's also the antidote for me talking more. So it's the antidote. And the Misha, anecdote. And the anecdote. Yes. So we're in editing. Early on. First day. Why does that look horrible? Out loud. Why, what, what's going on? Why does that look? I said, do you remember the conversation I had with you about the two cameras? No. Well, I begged you to use DigiBeta. Um, and everyone told you it would be okay. 
Bob laughed. I remember when Larry was shocked, but I don't remember Bob's response to initially when they said "Did you beta high eight? I he might not have known a lot about yeah, that. Yeah, because it was guessing. new. Because it was new. like he would have fought with me for that. So I don't remember. But anyhow, it was hysterical in editing. Okay, so casting. Let's yes. talk about the casting. Yes, uh, the casting was done by a lovely woman who I knew pretty well named Marla Garland. Uh, okay, so my, your my wife was the wife casting was the person. Ca- and by the way, so Marla had done casting before. You know, mm-hmm. and so it wasn't like, can my wife do it? Yeah, no, I just want to make she sure. Was, she no, was people a listening, if we don't point that out, they're going to go, oh, that's how it works. Yeah. It did help that I was her husband, but it didn't help because Larry doesn't like nepotism from the standpoint he doesn't want to have to fire someone's daughter. Right. You know, which I understand. I wouldn't. Right, so, so, go ahead. so Marla was the casting person. Mm-hmm. And so who was cast besides Cheryl? Okay, um, um, all the other every, parts. Yeah. All the other parts were cast. But the thing that was beautiful, uh, first off, what Larry and I learned, because we would do, we cast, we don't cast away anymore. Now it's people sit and sell, because of COVID, people self-tape and then we look at them. Right. But it used to be, people would come in the room to do a scene with Larry. They're doing it with Larry Yeah, on he the would audition. improvise with everybody yeah, in the audition. Yeah, and so, which is important to see. Uh, and it's very important because it's a, it's a separate skill. Right. Being a good actor or actress and being able to improvise are two completely different things. Well, and we'll have Cheryl on and she'll talk about it herself when he casts Cheryl because she was such the perfect person. Oh, the, I, I forgot to finish this first story, which goes with this. Okay. Larry and I were in shock at our chemistry. We had never acted together. And, and you weren't would, even that good friends at that point. No, we were friends. But, yeah, but that, not that great friends. Casual, yeah. Uh, okay. Now that's quite different. Yeah. He's my brother, you yeah. know. But back then, yeah, but, but we liked each other. Anyhow, yeah. we're doing these scenes and we like had to talk about it. Like, what the fuck is going on? Because it, it was like as if we had worked together the previous 20 years as a comedy team. Mm-hmm. It was like, wow. Now getting to Cheryl, uh, Marla brought in a lot of great people. People have gone on to some great success, but no one who came in until Cheryl and post Cheryl. Cheryl at that time was in the groundlings. Yes which is an improv group. Mm-hmm. And she was, she had not really done anything. No. She was working as she a nanny. One, yeah, she was, she was working, working as a nanny. Yeah. And I'm, wait, for, was it Rob, Rob Reiner? Reiner? Yeah. Yeah, that's, I forgot that. Yeah. Wow. So anyhow, she comes in and it's something about cereal. I don't remember what it was. The scene, the It was audition. about chicken. Chicken? What do you yeah, mean? Yeah, I remember. She's told me it's about something about chicken. Well, she's wrong. Okay. It was it was cereal. Cereal, okay. Yeah, about the way Larry eats his cereal, something along those lines. No chicken. It was cereal, which okay. is weird in itself. Yeah. She was the only one who made Larry nervous. She was the only one who could keep up with him, give it to him. Mm-hmm. No one else. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. One person. So obviously, she was hired. Right. Yeah, that's it. You know, she really gave it to him. And of course, in the show, perfect casting. And you and Cheryl are the only holdovers from this. Uh, yes, as far as acting and Larry, yes. But there wouldn't be any other holdovers. No. Yeah, these, we were we were doing the main part. So, I mean, if someone was a holdover, it's because they were so fantastic. You're like, wow, they have to be. A, and there were people who were great, but nothing who would fit in with what we with were what doing. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. We're done with this first episode. And you're keeping this in. I like shit like this in. 